welcome to our lesson number two for Sunday School. I am Janice Marson, and it is a great pleasure to be able to share the Word of God with you today. Listen, last week we talked about heritage, genealogy, we talked about uh, legacy, we talked about birthright. And so God has done a great thing in letting us continue in that vein. Today we're going to continue in the Christmas story, and we're going to tie it into the promise, promises, the prophecies, and the guidance of God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness, God. God, you've been so good to us this year. You've been so good to us this week. You've been so good to us today. God, thank you for this word. Bless those that are hearing. Bless those that are doing. And God, sit in my lap and have your way. Let this word be a light and a lamp, God, for your children. It's in the mighty, marvelous, matchless name of Jesus we pray, and we certainly do believe. Amen. Lesson number two. Today, participants will know that God keeps his promises. Find comfort in knowing his promises don't expire. No expiration date on God's promises. And plan to live in a position of trust toward God apart from their circumstances. Did you hear that? You're going to decide to live in a position and trust God apart from whatever situation or circumstance that you currently find yourself in. Let's read our Almost Perfect. It was a good life for Jerome and Stacy. Some would say almost perfect until one day it wasn't. They had been married for 10 years when their oldest daughter at the age of five started to go blind. The diagnosis was terrifying, Batten disease. This degenerative disease could slowly erode Skylar's nervous system, taking her ability to see, speak, move, and swallow. In all likelihood, it would lead to a short and difficult life. They went through all of the usual emotions of panic and grief, along with rounds of doctor visits, research on new therapies, and figuring out how to pay for her treatment. The couple was still adjusting to Skylar's challenges when a few years later, their second daughter, Veronica, started going blind as well. Whew. The result of combining two recessive genes from each parent, Batten disease, also started going blind. Um, also known as juvenile onset neuronal keroid lipofuscinosis is genetic. Not, now, not only would they lose their two precious children to this horrible disease, they couldn't bring themselves to risk passing it on to any other children. The couple often thought, how could God let this happen to our family? What does this mean for our future? They did what they had to do. They kept going. They provided their daughters with as many experiences as they could while each had their sight and mobility. Each of the girls developed their own personalities and pursuits. Even after mobility was difficult, Skylar and Veronica did not slow down. The girls wrote stories, they quilted, and even tried their hand at raising chickens. The family laughed together, they sang together, they prayed together, and they dreamed together. The girls contributed in their classrooms, they made friends, and showed Jerome and Stacy each day how to embrace life as it comes, rather than wishing for it to be something else. The girls didn't know they were dying and they didn't know that time would continue dealing with their bodies, cruel blows until they could do nothing on their own. They simply lived. They graduated high school, which was quite a feat for individuals with this disease. Jerome and Stacy rejoiced over each accomplishment, no matter how small. Through the heartache of each difficulty, God let them see that their two young women just by living, have indeed lived lives of impact. Many of the people they met along the way, which were doctors, caretakers, and classmates and friends, had been touched by their passion for living, their joy, and their love. In that sense, the family's legacy was a living one. Every life that brushed their daughters would carry with it something of their joy and their passion. 
and hopefully pass along those same qualities on to someone else. Looking back over parenting their two children, knowing the extraordinary treasure that God has entrusted them, Jerome and Stacy recognized that it was a good life. Some would say almost perfect. Let me ask you a question. Why should we trust God in the face of circumstances that we can't understand? Why should we trust him when we don't understand what's going on? That's a very good question. And a good Christian will give you a good Christian answer. But sometimes our hearts are so heavy and our hearts and our minds can't wrap around what's happening. The benefits of trusting God when we don't understand is that God knows how it's going to end. God has seen and he sees things from a different vantage point than we see. Let's go through our lesson today and see how God is going to help us understand how to hold on to him, how to trust him, how to believe him and love him, even when things around us are haywire. The biblical prophet is a speaker of God. God communicates directly with him or her, sometimes with future predictions and sometimes with commands from God. When he led the Israelites out of slavery and when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments, God spoke to Moses face to face. You can find that in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. God spoke frequently to his Old Testament people through the major and the minor prophets, Isaiah through Malachi. God still speaks through individuals today, but not in a way that brings novel revelation because we now have the complete word of God, which is the Bible, and it speaks to all people everywhere. The Greek word angelos means messenger or angel and may refer to an earthly or a heavenly being. Although angels have an exalted position, we are warned not to worship them, never. That's in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Angels serve many functions, but their primary functions are as messengers and ministers of God to humanity. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. They bring God's specific, they bring God's specific commands. They assist people in times of distress and even carry out military missions. And that's in 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 through 7, and again in Daniel chapter 10. Jesus indicated the existence of personal guardian angels. Why does God communicate differently at different times, whether through prophets, angels, or his son? We're going to go and read our scripture today, and then we're going to talk about ways that God speaks or communicates to us. Our Make It Stick says, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's from Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Our word from the New Living Testament today comes from chapter 1 one of Matthew's and starts at the 18th verse. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look! The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But 
He did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. The book of Matthews is called the Jewish Gospel because its intended audience is the Jewish. It is rooted in Old Testament prophecy related to the coming Messiah through the lineage of King David. We talked about that, the genealogy, last week, right? The first chapter of Matthew presents Jesus' royal lineage, lineage, describing his kingly line and rightful place as heir to David's throne. Remember, we went through the begats and those who fathered, and we found out that uh, Jesus was a rightful heir to the throne of David through both Joseph and through his mother Mary. And both of these lineages shows that he is not only a, a heavenly being, that he is all God, but he is all human as well. The first chapter of Matthew presents Jesus' royal lineage describing his kingly line and rightful place as heir to David's throne. His legal inheritance comes through the line of Solomon through Joseph. Jesus' earthly father, Jesus' lineage proves that he has the right to be called the king of Jews. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, which gives him the right to be called the Son of God. He is fully God and fully human. There it is. He is the living word who came down from heaven. He's clothed in human flesh and dwelled among people. His virgin birth fulfilled the prophetic utterances of Isaiah, the sinless and divine nature of Jesus makes him the only man capable of shedding divine blood on the cross and becoming the final atonement for our sin. What does it tell us about God to know that Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies? What does that tell us? It tells us that God gives his promises and that he's faithful to keep them. That means whenever God speaks it, when you hear God say a thing, it's going to come to pass. You, can't, you can put it in the bank. It's going to happen for sure. There are eight ways, or there are probably many ways that God speaks to us. But if you're taking notes, I want you to keep in mind eight ways that God speaks to us. One is through his word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 tells us that the word of God is breathed. It's breathed by him. It's inspired by him. It comes straight from him. Number two, God speaks to us through the life and death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every story that we read from Matthews to the book of Revelation speaks to us about how we should live our life and how we should expect to see Jesus when all of this is said and done. Number three, God speaks to us through nature and creation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 says, Man is without excuse that God will use nature and he will use creation to speak to man. He'll speak to man through a storm, through the wind, through the leaves on the trees, even through a bark of a dog or the rustle of, of leaves on the ground. God speaks and he'll get his message across by any means necessary. Number four, God speaks to us through other believers. Why do you always hear Pastor Johnson say, forsake not the assembly? Don't forget to get together with the saints, which is why I'm so appreciative and so grateful and so glad. And I'm sure God is glad that you take the time to come and sit around your computer or get in front of your TV and you uh, learn about the word of God and you uh, open your Bible and you open your books and you, you study and you take the time to listen to what God has to say. So that's how God speaks to us through believers. He speaks through you no matter what your age is, where you live at, what grade you're in. And he speaks to you and he speaks through you to your parents, to me, to Pastor Johnson, to any adult, to any other believer. God speaks to us through music. You may think this is crazy, but God speaks to us through all types of music. Even um, the music where they don't even mention his name. There are books in the Bible where God is not even mentioned, but God will use music, uh, instrumental music, He'll uh, good singing. God will speak to you and move you 
and, and share his word and share his intention and share his heart with you through music. Uh, let me know if you believe that and you agree with that because I love music so much. God also speaks to us through circumstances. Yeah, you may hear that sometimes God will put us on our back to get our attention. Um, I don't like to lean towards that, that method of, of God speaking to us, but God will speak to us through circumstances. And sometimes it's not even our own circumstances. We can see other people going through things. We can see the homeless and we could see uh, people that are hurt, people that are in the hospital or nursing homes who are sick. And we can just keep in mind that uh, that could be us, but God protects us and God guides us. And these people, because of their circumstances and their situations and because we are Christians, they need us and they require us to help them and to give them a word of encouragement, a coat, a hug, a smile, some food. That is our duty. That's how God speaks to us. God speaks to us through his spirit. You can be home alone. You could be on the road. You could be at work. You could be hanging out with your friends. And God will use his spirit just like he used his spirit to speak to Mary and to speak to Joseph. He does it still today. Uh, the Bible doesn't just tell us what happened back then. But the Bible is so relevant and it has so much clarity that it even speaks to us today. And finally, God speaks to us through prayer. Baby, you've got to pray. You have got to make time to pray. And it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. You want to hear from God. You want to know what God wants you to do. You want that direction, and you get that through prayer. Even if it's just, hey, God, uh, take my day, and you have control, and let it be blessed. Amen. That's a simple prayer. Even if you can't get all that out, God, I thank you. That's prayer. Or God, help me. That's a prayer. But God needs to hear your voice and he needs to hear your heart because he wants you to hear his voice and he needs you to hear his heart. So let's pray. Let's keep our prayer life going. And if we haven't been praying, let's pray a little bit harder because the world needs it. I need it. Maybe you need it. There are three C's that are in this lesson today, and it reminds me of when Pastor Johnson develops his sermons so that we can remember them. Those three C's today are conception, correction, and clarity, each one of those being divine. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 speaks about the divine conception. I won't read all of that because if you're 14 through the age of 18 and you've been in church long enough, you know the story of the, the immaculate conception of the Virgin Mary. Divine correction. So if you also know the story of Jesus and you know the story of Joseph, you know that uh, some versions of the Bible says that Joseph was going to put her away privily. That means he was going to break off the engagement. They hadn't gone through a full-blown wedding. They were betrothed to be married. They were engaged. But the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, came to Joseph and asked him not to do that. Don't divorce her. Stick with her. This child that she's carrying is from the Holy Spirit. She is has not been running around on you. She has not been cutting out on you. She is faithful to you, and this child is a divine child. The lesson says that God sent an angel to Joseph in a dream to stop the divorce. The dream imparted three key things. First, Joseph was reassured that Mary had not been unfaithful. That's in verse 20. Joseph must see this child as God's child and this event as a God event. When God speaks into our situation, we see more clearly. Amen. And our relationships are put in the right perspective. So secondly, Joseph was told the baby sex, that he was going to have a baby boy and what he was going to name them. The name Jesus is a Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua or Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. Thirdly, he and he was told the baby's divine purpose. He shall save his people from their sins. God also clarifies the situation by pointing back in scripture. Although, also, this can be understood by what God had already said through the prophet Isaiah. Our belief in God is not wishful thinking. Our belief in God is not wishful thinking. It's not something that's founded on something that's not valid, some, uh, a fable 
or hearsay. Rather, our faith like Joseph's acceptance of Mary, just because the Holy Spirit said that she's a good girl, that don't divorce her. This is true and this is God's plan. This is grounded in prophetic insight coming directly from God. You can take today's lesson as insight coming directly from God. There is a plan for your life. There is a purpose for your still living here. God's done a great thing by keeping you through this pandemic, by keeping your family through this pandemic. There's a plan and a purpose for your life. So that comes with divine clarity. And that goes all the way to human obedience. We see obedience all through this lesson, don't we? Too many of us spend time fighting with God when we should take a lesson from Joseph and stop worrying about how God guides us. God would only command us to do something consistent with his word. God is not going to make up something new for you to do. You can find it in the word of God. After God told Joseph what to do, human opinion no longer mattered. It didn't matter what people thought about Mary being pregnant as soon as she got married. It didn't matter. God already had a plan and he had it laid out for both of them. Instead, he chose to please the one who was in charge of his life. Did you hear what I just said? Joseph decided to please the one who was in charge of his life because people going to come and go. People are going to think about you, whatever they're going to think, whether it's true or untrue. Let people think what they think. It is what it is, right? Joseph married Mary and named the child Jesus just as he was told. He was obedient. God never makes mistakes. He never makes mistakes. He didn't pick just any virgin or any carpenter, and there were likely scores of both in Nazareth. Instead, God chose the couple who would individually and together place his will above everything. Their individual and their collective actions made the family that paved the way for the new community that will be known as one that fosters belonging and acceptance. How many of you know that God is intentional? God knows what you're wearing right now. God knows where you're sitting right now. And God knows exactly what you're thinking. I want to give you five ways that God guides us. And I want you to think about how God commands us. He guides us through commands, and those commands are in the scriptures. And it's not just the Ten Commandments that's found in the Old Testament. It's not just the Ten Commandments that um, uh, Sister Rose taught you in Sunday school. But it's throughout the Bible. Read the whole Bible. There are commands, and those are ways that God, com that, that God guides us. God guides us by compelling us. And compulsions or compelling comes through the Spirit of God. No, you may not be speaking in tongues or running around the church, but you have the Holy Spirit. You have the guidance of God's Spirit. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You are also guided by counseling. And that's through your parents. That's through Pastor Johnson. That's through your Sunday school teachers. That's through the elders. That's through people that and your teachers at school. That's how you are guided. You are guided through counseling. When your parents tell you uh, you can't stay up past 10, that's so that you can get enough sleep so that you can retain what you learned through the day and you can use it for another day. You can use it the next day. When a, a Sunday school teacher tells you to read Psalms 91, it's important that you do that because it's going to be good for your spiritual growth. God also guides us through common sense. Now, I'm going to be honest. Uh, sometimes common sense just ain't common. But we all have a measure of common sense. God has given that to you as a gift. Use it. And finally, God guides us through circumstances. Sometimes uh, we can be at a traffic light if you're a driver. And uh, you may need to go make a left at the traffic light. And there's a... Uh, traffic back up on, on making the left turn. So God guides you through that circumstance to keep straight. But what you didn't know is that there was a wreck on the way of making a left. So God guides us. He knows what's what's good for us. He knows what's your what's in your best interest. And so I encourage you to trust him. Nothing takes God by surprise. So he cannot be disappointed. You may have done something you may have thought something, you have, may have omitted to do something, but God is not surprised. He chose you. He's intentional about choosing you. 
He's intentional and purposeful about using you. You be encouraged. You keep thinking about the ways that God speaks to us. You ask God to speak to you. You keep praying to him. And you think about the ways that God guides us. Just like God guided Joseph. Just like God and the angel angel speak, spoke to Mary. God is doing that for you today. So until the next time we have Sunday school again, you be encouraged. You be blessed. Stay safe. Give your person six feet. Wear your mask and wash your hands. We'll see you. God bless you. Love you.